Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, today, during my uh, children's Devo, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, something called faith. And I have three helpers that are going to help me answer a question, what does, f what does it mean to have faith in something? So you guys can come on up here. All right, so Lincoln's first. What does it mean to have faith in something, Lincoln? Faith means to believe in, like, a trust law. If you believe in your dad, you have faith in him. All right, that's a good answer. Evan, what about you? To, uh, just to believe and trust in it, whatever you're faithful in. Okay, and Addie. <coughs> believe and trust in it. All right, yeah, those are some really cool uh, definitions of faith. And to me, faith is really believing in something that you can't see. So like the example we have of God, we can't see him, but we still believe in him. And I'm going to read a passage of scripture found in James 2, verses 21 to 24, which says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac at the on the altar? You see, the fa you see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and he was counted on him as righteous. And he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. So here he's talking about how Abraham was asked by God to sacrifice his son Isaac. And he was going to because he had faith in him. In verse 22, where it talks about the works more, uh, we're going to kind of focus on that one today. Uh, and I would like to give you a few examples of some things that work together. So we all know there's a lot of things that just naturally go together. Like we have cereal and milk. We have Batman and Robin. We have John Deere tractors and farming. And we have pizza and youth ministry. Those all really go together well. But one thing that really works together is a pitcher and a catcher. So I have a baseball here as kind of a, a visual. Pitcher and a catcher during a baseball game. And with baseball hopefully starting up soon, uh, we're going to be able to see how well they work together. And if they're not on the same page, something can happen. What, what could happen? Maybe the catcher wants the pitcher to throw a fastball low and outside, and the pitcher wants to throw a curveball that will kind of be on the inside corner. The pitcher gets his way, throws the curveball, and it doesn't go as he intends it. Instead, the curveball goes right over the middle of the plate, hangs right over the middle of the plate, and it gets launched 400 feet for a home run. So that's why it's important for both of these people to uh, work together and be on the same page. Otherwise, something like giving up a home run could be the result. And there are also some things that don't work well together. And so we have electricity and water. Those don't go well together. Orange juice and toothpaste do not go well together at all. East of Chicago pizza and the glaze that you put on the Cinepops, although Ethan thinks that they go together well, because he tried that one time. He was trying to get everybody else to try it. I didn't want to try it because it didn't look good. And a metal spoon, or anything metal, and a microwave. So as you can see, I have a little experiment right here. I have water with green food coloring, and I have vegetable oil. So we're going to mix them together and see what happens. So if you can kind of see it here, the oil went right to the top. They separate because the oil is actually lighter than water. And this is kind of, when it comes to our faith, and we also need works. 
So they need to be more like the pitcher and the catcher working together and not like the oil and the water. When we have true faith, it always results in works, but the works don't support it fully. Faith brings us salvation, which is an act of obedience, uh, demonstrating our faith is genuine. And Abraham, back in the Old Testament and here in James, had a genuine faith when it came to God asking him to sacrifice his son that he had been waiting on his entire life. He knew that God would provide another sacrifice. That is genuine, the genuine faith that we're talking about here. And this is the same when God sent Jesus to die for us. Jesus was that ultimate, sa ultimate and pure sacrifice that was needed to forgive the sins of everybody else. So here in a few minutes, uh, Ethan is going to talk a little bit more about Abraham and the faith that he had and how God asked him to sacrifice Isaac, the son that he had waited for and was promised to him by God. As we come now to the time in the service when we partake in communion, it would be good for us to think about its importance. Jesus told us to do this. He talked about it at the Last Supper. Do this in remembrance of me. We know the early church did this. It's mentioned in Acts and the letter to the Corinthians. We do this now to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. The wine and the bread, symbols of his blood and body shed for us and broken for us. It's powerful, yet selfless act done to forgive our sins. It's amazing. We need to examine ourselves and remember how thankful we are that we have this new life in Him. Let's pray. Dear Lord, please help us to remember your sacrifice. Please help us to um, examine ourselves and, and help us not to um, have unrepentant sin, but to release those to you, to um, seek forgiveness and repent. Please help us to um, take this communion now in a way that it glorifies you and um, helps us to remember what you have done for us. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, I'm going to turn this way for just a second. Live studio audience, are you ready? Good morning, Warren Church Christ. Good morning. Oh, I just love it so much. It's like my favorite thing. Okay, so I have some prayer requests and some praises this morning I'm so excited to share with you. Uh, we've been praying for Alex and Rachel Fiox. That's Ted and Lori Fiox, uh, son and daughter-in-law. Uh, they're expecting twins and expecting them to come early, and they did. They were somewhere between 31 and 32 weeks. They had a boy and a girl, um, you know, meh, three pounds, 10 ounces, four pounds, five ounces, respectively. They're doing okay. Um, they came this week, so that's such a blessing. Uh, also, we got an update on Sarah Bright. She had her big surgery on her arm and her leg, and things went really well. She was able to move from her ICU room to a regular room last night about 9 o'clock. She said the pain is manageable. They started a little physical therapy on her fingers, and she's really doing pretty well, so that's a huge praise. Uh, we have some news. Um, Lake James Christian Camp has canceled all the camps for the year. That's a big bummer. A lot of our students were hoping that maybe they'd be able to at least go to a shortened camp or something this year, but that's kind of 
out of the plans for the rest of the year. And then um, a prayer request for the country. Uh, if you guys have been following the news at all in the last few days, you've heard about some riots. There were even some riots up in Fort Wayne um, related to race inequality and poor treatment by some folks in law enforcement. And we know that that's causing a lot of pain and heartache in our country. So if you guys could keep that in mind too, we'd be praying for our country this week, that would be great. And if you ever have prayer requests or praises that you wanna share with us, you can text any of the staff or you can put it on our Facebook page, send us a message, write us a note, put it in the mail, however you wanna let us know. And then if you guys would all just uh, bow your heads and pray with me real quickly. Father God, we come to you in the name of Jesus, and we are so thankful that you have given us this open door, that we can come to you personally. We don't need an intermediary, that when any of us have a request or a praise, uh, that we can come to you, and we can put that before you, and you promise to listen. God, we ask that you would work in the lives of those uh, who are either struggling with a health issue, uh, who are living with some uncertainty and fear, and, and to also bring joy to those who have things to rejoice about this week, um, new babies and healing bodies. God, I pray that you would put your healing hand on our country too, that you would touch the hearts of those who are feeling anger, who are feeling vulnerable and afraid right now, that your supernatural peace would invade this country and bring about the kind of rest and restoration that we need. God, we thank you for allowing us to gather today, virtually and in person. And we ask that you would uh, continue to bless us. Bless Ethan as he preaches the sermon today. And uh, we ask all in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Okay, well, uh, I want to reiterate what was just said by Liz. Of course, whenever you have prayer requests, please reach out to us. Uh, you can even text me, and we'll, we have a prayer team that's active, and they're praying for you. We have about 30 people who are doing that. So when you have prayer requests, we definitely want to hear from you. <clears throat> over the last month, we have, over the last few months, we have experienced unprecedented things this is how uh, Liz wrapped up our prayer time, and she mentioned that we're living in a time of crisis, which we are and we were, and then this past week with the death of George Flynn and uh, the, the difficulties of what law enforcement has to do mixed in with uh, some inequalities, our country has, our, our main cities have been, it feels like set ablaze, and this can, uh, this, this can put a lot of pressure on our shoulders, and we're not even involved, we live in rural America. But my sermon title today is God Will Provide, and my prayer is that God will provide in our daily lives, and that he will provide all the more during COVID-19 and during the, the unrest that's going on right now. It's my prayer that, that his name will be shared, and that he will provide a way for people to find healing. And the best example that I have of God providing is literally when Abraham names a place in Israel he calls it God will provide. So I want to tell you a story today. We're going to go through a, a well-known passage. It's in Genesis chapter 22. Have a Bible available. We'll have most of these verses pop up on the screen as well. But in the Old Testament, you find a man named Abraham. Abraham had what? Many sons. That's the blessing that comes from God providing after Abraham is faithful and after Abraham is obedient. Even when God puts Abraham to the ultimate test. So maybe the most well-known part of Abraham's story, there's a lot of stories that are known for Abraham, but maybe the most well-known is the one in my Bible titled, Abraham Tested, Genesis chapter 22. And in this story, Abraham is called upon by God. He's called upon by God because God is testing his faith. He wants to see how obedient he is. So grab that Bible, head over to Genesis chapter 22, God is calling on Abraham to make a sacrifice, a sacrifice of a son, his son Isaac. And it's the same son that God had promised to Abraham that he would build a nation through. If you're promised that a nation is going to be built through your son, you're probably not expecting God to say, go and sacrifice your son. It doesn't make a lot of sense. That's why we want to read the whole story. So jump in, let's look at the first verse. We read Genesis chapter 22 and... 
This was a test. But Abraham doesn't know it yet. So sometime later, God tested Abraham. So we know it's a test from the beginning. Uh, what in the world could be running through Abraham's mind when he hears, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to Abraham, he said to him, Abraham, here I am. Abraham replied. Verse 2, here's what it says. Then God said, take your son, Isaac. Take your only son, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. We'll pause. This mountain, uh, I preached on this a few years back, and this mountain, this, this high area becomes something very important, which we'll share at the end of our service today. But the love that Abraham has for his son Isaac, he's a miracle child. And I know some of you here have, uh, have miracle children as well. And just imagine what Abraham is going through when he hears this. For so long, he's saying, God, it was so hard to have this child, and now you're asking me to kill my blessing. You're asking me to kill my son. And this whole story in Genesis chapter 22, when I was reading through it, it's completely the opposite, completely contrary to what and who God is. And, uh, you know, God, he's never required, when I read through the Bible, he's never required anyone to make a human sacrifice and in fact, in Deuteronomy, it actually forbids the practice of human sacrifice. So why did God do this? And this story in Genesis 22, it shows you, it shows me that God will provide. That's the message. It's literally written in the words. God will provide. He'll provide for the father and the son in this story. And our loving father will also provide for each of us. So here's what I read about Abraham. Notice in verse 3 of chapter 22, it just simply says, early in the next morning, he heads out. It says this, early the next morning, Abraham got up and saddled his donkey. He took with him two servants, two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out to the place God had told him about. So that's where it stops in verse 3. Again, you have to have faith, a lot of faith, and I love this faith that's seen here, that's being shown. Early the next morning, it says, Abraham, he goes and he obeys God. He doesn't understand what's going on, but he obeys God. I think uh, through this whole story, Abraham knows whatever the outcome is going to be, God will provide. So Abraham, he obeys. It's a three-day journey. I'm assuming he has a lot of questions. Why, God? Why are you asking this of me? Three days can be a long time to think about something. You know, this is the son that you promised me. You promised me to build a great nation. But Abraham, he obeys, and that's faith right there. So I liked how Andrew asked several of our kids up front here, what does faith mean? And it really truly is obeying uh, and, and, and not, not fully understanding something. In a few moments, we'll use a few quotes that I found to explain faith. But I was thinking about this. Uh, I'm trying to read. We should have used Duracell batteries today instead of the generic ones. I'm just joking. I was saying uh, I enjoy, I'm trying to enjoy more reading books. And I noticed that, uh, you know, you might pick a book, a book based on the, a genre or you might pick it based on the author. And authors will typically give you a, a twist. Uh, you get to know which author does which things. And uh, sometimes I get frustrated with the authors I'm reading because they don't do what I wanted them to do. Or they, they might kill off a character I wanted to stay on longer or there's a twist that I wasn't expecting. And you kind of start to not like what this author that you trust is doing. But if you have read that author before, uh, you, you trust them. You keep turning the pages, you, you keep reading, and you, you just appreciate what comes. You trust that it'll all work out in the end. And the reason I brought that up is because uh, a mature Christian sometimes, and maybe you're that mature Christian, 
Maybe it's a minister, maybe it's a friend, but sometimes we need to speak up and we need to say, keep reading. We need to say the story isn't over yet. God will provide. It might not be going the way you expected, but God is in this situation. So I just want to pause and say that, but I want us to jump back into Genesis 22 again. Let's look at verse 5. In a moment, we're going to kind of read a bigger swath of the scripture. But verse 5 says this. He, Abraham, he said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. I read that kind of in a monotone v voice on purpose because I didn't want to give away what I'm about to say. Did you catch what those words said? It said, we will worship Abraham and Isaac. It said, we will come back. And Abraham is being tested, but he understands that he's experiencing the mighty power of God during this. And, you know, he knows that he received this child late in his life. He's trusting God. He's obeying him, but he's still trusting in God. And I'm sure that the, the, the servants were probably puzzled, and I'm guessing that Isaac was confused too, because uh, where's the animal for the sacrifice? We have the wood for the altar. Uh, the servants didn't ask, and Isaac didn't ask until later. But pick back up in verses 6, 7, and 8. It says, Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac to carry. And he carried the fire and the knife. As Abraham and Isaac went on together, Isaac spoke up and he said to his, he said to his father, Abraham, he said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replies, the fire and wood are here, Isaac said. And Isaac's about 15 at this time. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide. You hear that word provide? He'll provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So right here in, in this part of the story, uh, uh, a young teenager, definitely fast enough to get away from his old father, is not only listening and obeying himself, but he's also carrying the very wood and the knife that will make up what would potentially kill him. So I always like to pause here and appreciate Isaac, because it's Abraham who's tested and who gets the credit for his faith, but I really appreciate this teenage boy. If I was a 15-year-old boy, I probably wouldn't voluntarily carry uh, the wood that was going to be used. Uh, and I'm, I'm beginning to understand the, the scenario and situation here that I'm going to be the one sacrificed. I'd be a little more upset than what we see from Isaac. But we have the father and son. Uh, they go together until they reach the place that God has intended. It's uh, Mount Moriah. They get there. Abraham removes the wood from, Ab from Isaac's back. He builds the altar for worship. And then he arranges the wood on top of the altar to burn. I wish there was more details. I wish there's several places in our Bible where we wish there's more details. But I wish I could hear what was going through the mind of Abraham, what Isaac was thinking. What we have is what we see in verses 9 through 14. Picking back up, this is where we're stopped today. It says, when they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built, built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He found his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, Abraham replied. Do not, I repeat, do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. It continues, Abraham looked up, and there in a the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, you can say it with me, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. I love the end of that part of the story. The Lord will provide. I want you to keep reading the conclusion. I'll kind of explain it, but we're not going to read any more out of Genesis 22. But uh, kind of summing it up, Isaac, Abraham's son, he grows up and he marries Rebekah. It's a great story. And they, they, they're married. And 20 years after they married, they have, they have their first child, 
their first children. Actually, it's twins. It's Jacob and Esau. Esau and Jacob, to be more uh, factual. God starts to, to move a little bit more quickly in his nation building because Isaac, uh, he has Jacob, and Jacob has 12 sons, and they become the 12 tribes of Israel, and millions and millions of people come from what happens right here in our story in Genesis 22. And here's what I want us to understand. Here's what I need to understand. This is, this story, Abraham being tested, the faith and obedience of Abraham, it's a part of the bigger picture. It's a small piece of a big picture. This piece is kind of like the lower story of the, the story that God has going on. And God's trying to tell us something. Uh, do you remember, you know, it's getting a little harder for me to think back to my school days. Maybe you're the same way. But you have to learn things in English class. And one of those things is a term called foreshadowing. Anybody remember the word foreshadowing? Um, it's kind of a hint of what's to come later. And this story told in Genesis 22 isn't just to be kept right here. It's actually foreshadowing something because Mount Moriah, this region, is also the same place that Jesus will later several centuries later, be crucified, right? And I want to pause on that thought because I want to wonder, I'm wondering how does my obedience compare to that of Abraham, let alone of Jesus? It's easy to say I'm going to trust God. It's easy to appreciate the money that says in God we trust. But often we, we go ahead and, and the situation we're in, um, we, let our, we, we try to figure it out ourselves. We, we try to move ahead in our own power, not allowing God to provide as it says. And when we do this, we miss a chance, we miss an experience, an opportunity to be blessed. That makes sense? So what do you need to do, what do we need to do, each of us, today, to trust God? What do we need to do to allow Him, to need Him, to provide for us? Well, I'll have something pop on the screen, because this is my main point that I want us to remember. It's just this. Faith is trusting God. Even when the story doesn't make sense. Now, I love the, the, the verse that's, that's there with it. It's Galatians 3, 11. The just live by faith. Okay, so faith is trusting God even when the story doesn't make sense. And then Galatians 3, 11. The just shall live by faith. Now, when I was working on our message that we're sharing today... I wanted to find a, an, just a different illustration, something that might, might hit home with some of you or some of us who are, are listening online. And I found the story of a missionary, and he and his wife, Robert Mary Moffat, they are from the early to mid-19th century. And in fact, this isn't a part of our story today, but I want you to know that uh, Robert and Mary M Moffat had a daughter who would eventually marry David Livingston, who is one of the most well-known missionaries in all of Africa. It's kind of a neat connection. But in this story on faith, it goes like this. It says, for 10 years, this couple, which is Robert and Mary Moffat, they labored faithfully in Bukunaland. Bukan Bukan it's pretty much Botswana near South Africa now. And they labored for 10 years, sharing the name of Jesus Christ. And for 10 years, they went without one ray of encouragement to brighten their way, it says. They couldn't report on a single convert. And that can be difficult when you're a missionary. You need to see results to encourage others to contribute to the cause. And it says, finally, the directors of their mission board began to question the wisdom of continuing their work. The thought of leaving their post, however brought great grief to this devoted couple. They felt sure that God was in their labors and that he would turn the people, he would turn the people's minds and souls to know Christ. It says, they stayed for a year longer or two and darkness continued to reign. Then one day a friend, and I always appreciate a friend in these stories, maybe that can be you or me. Then one day a friend in England sent word to the Moffats that she wanted to mail them a gift and she asked them what they would like. Trusting that in time the Lord would bless their work, Miss, Mrs. Moffat replied, send us a communion set. I like that. Send us a communion set. She said, I'm sure it will soon be needed. 
And God honored that dear woman's faith, it says. The Holy Spirit moved upon the hearts of the villagers, and soon a little group of six converts was united to form the first Christian church in that land. It, it wraps up and says, The communion set from England was delayed in the mail, but on the very day before the first commemoration of the Lord's Supper in this country, the set arrived. I just appreciate the faithfulness and obedience of 10 or 12 or 13 years of this couple. And they saw no fruit being multiplied. But yet, they stayed faithful. This is another example of the story of Abraham being tested, I think. Now I have, I'll have uh, on the screen behind me, and, and for the, those of you participating digitally, I'll have it pop up on the screen. But here is a few, a few people who uh, have thought this through and have studied God's word. And here's their quotes on what faith is. The first one comes from J.G. Mackin. He says, The more we know of God, the more unreservedly we will trust Him. And I like this part. The greater our progress in theology, the simple and more childlike will be our faith. I like that one. Martin Luther King, he makes it more uh, easy to see. He says, Faith is taking the first step, even when you don't see the whole staircase. And I thought, I've got to use that one because it, that's Genesis 22 right there. That's Abraham following. And this one for our, uh, for our young folk. Faith is like Wi-Fi. It's invisible, but it has the power to connect you to what you need. I like those words. I appreciate those words on faith from those uh, different sources. And Abraham, who was willing to give up his own son when God commanded him to do so, uh, God didn't let Abraham sacrifice. He, he didn't let him take Isaac's life because God gave a command in order for Abraham to be tested. And Abraham made it to the, to the Hall of Fame for Faith, which a lot of us know comes out of Hebrews, the 11th chapter. And it says this in Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19. By faith, Abraham when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and so in a manner of speaking he did receive Isaac back from the dead. I appreciate those words that come out of Hebrews, written by an author, more than likely the Apostle Paul, he wanted to make sure we honored a man who lived a faithful life. And instead of taking Abraham's son, God made a whole nation, descendants of Israel, descendants of Jacob, which you and I have been blessed because of. We've been blessed because Jesus Christ comes from this race. And if you're afraid to trust God uh, with your most prized possessions or with your biggest dreams or even with yourself, then pay attention to Abraham's story. Pay attention to the example of Abraham, because Abraham was willing to, to give up everything for God. And because of this, he, was, he received more than he could ever imagine. What we receive, think about it. What we receive isn't always immediate. It's not always in the form of possessions. It's not always in the way that Americans think it should be. Material things, they, they may be among Honestly, the least satisfying rewards you can get. Our greatest, our best rewards, they wait for us in eternity. And in fact, just this past week, as we honored and celebrated the life of Ray Hosier, one of our long-standing members, uh, it was my honor to participate in the service. And I shared the words that if we understood what Ray has now, you and I would be jealous. Our true rewards aren't on this earth. They're in heaven. So all of our stories won't look like that of Abraham and his wife Sarah, and their children. But Genesis 22, it shows us that we have a father in this story who is willing to follow God's command. And it's really foreshadowing of our father who does sacrifice his son, Jesus Christ. It was a test back in the Old Testament for Abraham, but soon there would come a day when that same that same area, Mount Moriah, where God was sacrificed, not in a test, but in real life, his son for me, his son for you. 
And that's my invitation to you today. Look to Abraham, who was chosen by God, not because he was qualified, not because he deserved it, but because he had faith in a day when faith was fleeting. And on today, I pray that God calls you, not because you're qualified, but because you have faith in God. You've, you've placed your faith, your hope, your trust in Him. And when we do this, God will provide. I'd like us to, to pray together. And as we close in our, in our closing song, I pray that you ask God to stir your heart this day to step out of your comfort zone and allow him to lead you through faith and obedience. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, uh, we, love, we love to hear your voice. Some of us say we don't hear your voice. We've never heard your voice. God, I challenge those people to dig deep into your word and that they will pray that the Holy Spirit will speak to them. I pray, God, that through our prayer lives and through our study of your word, that you will give us the right ears to hear and the right heart to quickly respond. God, when we worship, teach us, teach us what you want from us. Allow the songs to speak to us. Remind us of your faithfulness as we trust in you. Hear our prayer, O oh God, on this day. We love you. We thank you for our church family and friends. We pray, God, that you will provide. Amen.